Waiting does not equal bad news. Waiting does not equal bad news. Waiting does not equal. I've been waiting for almost a month on test results. A mammogram, then another, and now a biopsy. And I get the call. They want me to come in. The first thing my doctor tells me is, Nancy, we've got work to do. What the fuck? I expected him to be direct, to use the words breast cancer. But no, we've got work to do. Wait a minute. Uh, hold on. What, what, kind of, what are you trying to tell me here now? Nancy, you're an English teacher. Have you seen this play, Wit? In the play, some witchy woman dies of breast cancer. After being spared enough time to realize how she's ruined her own life and could have been more compassionate to her students and others, dies of breast cancer. Dies. Fucking A. Can you just read me the path report, please? Ductal carcinoma in C2, right breast. Before I leave, he tears off a prescription sheet with work to do, make appointments with three doctors, set up pre-surgery tests. I get in my car and stare at the prescription sheet. I can feel my fingers shaking on the steering wheel. I'm already late to a meeting at work. I start up the block, but then I pull into a parking lot. My phone's in my hand, and I take a moment. My husband Don is probably on a ladder wrapping up a painting job on a busy Friday morning. I've been married to him since he was 29, and in a month we'll throw his 50th birthday party. I love this man. I've been staring at his photo on my screensaver. This lanky big guy, his hands wrapped around our dogs. He's still Midwest quiet and unassuming, dry humored, sometimes a little grumpy, but after two plus decades together, the most rock steady loving person I've known. He's top of my phone faves and I tap his name. Hi, hon. What'd he say? He asked me. Well, he said, the biopsy showed I have breast cancer. The cancer cells are in a milk duct. I can hear us both breathing, then shuffling, some clanking, like maybe he's getting off the ladder with a paint bucket and walking. Well, where are you? I'm going to meet you. I don't know. I'm in a parking lot. I just drove here from the office. I'm supposed to be at school. Well, just go home. I'll be there. Are you okay to drive? It's a gray October Friday morning in OB and guys are already swinging 24 packs of beer to their cars in the lot. People walk by, I lower my gaze to the car floor, piles of manila folders with school meeting notes, weekends essays to grade, a couple of stained coffee mugs. Yeah, I'm fine. I drive home thinking, I hope this doesn't change us. I wanna keep our life, our lovemaking. How's this going to work, seeing me naked, missing a breast? Then a few more weeks of waiting, and it's mid-November. We're going for the cure, Nancy, says the surgeon. I think, I said something back like, well, <laughs> great, but I'd read I can never be completely sure of being cured. I can meet milestones, five years out, ten years, but it can come back. You're a survivor until you're not, I guess. He says, there's choices. He explains how younger women choose lumpectomy with radiation because it's breast preserving and the odds of longevity can be the same as doing the mastectomy. With a mastectomy option, if the path report comes back clean, after the mastectomy, I could be done. No radiation, burning, no chemo, barfing, I leave his office. I head next door. I'm on the way to the plastic surgeons, but I walk right past and go to the bathroom. 
I feel like barfing. I splash water on my face. No paper towels, only those high-tech hand dryers that sound like jet engines. I grab toilet paper. Thin gray pieces are stuck to my chin and my forehead. I lean forward and I pull out my lipstick. I put it on. And that's when I realize I'm afraid because I want to live. That's what I'm here for. I want to do whatever it takes to beat this thing, even if I have to lose a boob. I stomp into the plastic surgeon's office. You know, you could bump up to a C cup while you're at it, he tells me. While you're at it, what, while I'm at it means that at the time of the mastectomy alongside the surgeon, the plastic dot could upgrade my whole rack by slipping a smaller implant into my healthy boob to give me a perky matching pair. They got a match, right? I don't know too many women who do perfectly. You're not going to like it in a few more years, he says, when the natural one starts sagging and the one I give you is up here. What? He's flipping through a binder full of boob jobs. He wants to show me I have options. There's the rub-on nipples. There's the temporary tattoos. And maybe, if all goes well, I could get a real nipple from my own skin and a real tattoo of an areola around that nipple. Hey, my first tattoo. <laughs> I don't want to think about this shit, but I say, I'm not really sure, so I won't feel anything on the mastectomy side all the way up to my armpit? Well, you won't have any sensation over the nipple and parts of your healthy boob with a smaller implant either. No, thank you. It's just too much to think about now. I just want a clean path report after surgery so I know I'll live. I don't have a road map for how to decide or how to get through this waiting. So I go to Sharp Hospital Breast Cancer Support Group. I listen to what some of those ladies chose, bald women, swollen face from steroids and drugs. But some look better, laughing and eating pink turkey-shaped cookies for Thanksgiving week. One woman jumps up and says, here, pushing out her right breast under her black t-shirt, Come feel, it's not like a baseball. I blushed, oh, maybe later, thanks. Another girl, a five-year survivor, drags me into the bathroom, pulls up her shirt, not bad, huh? She grabs my hand and smacks it right on her boob. Who knew cancer would mean feeling up so many boobs? <laughs> At work, I keep busy, but left to myself late afternoon, I hunker down with the Food Network's Giada at home and her perfect makeup and sliver of cleavage all misty above a pan of boiling pasta sauce. <laughs> Must be nice, Giada. Enjoy those while you can. <laughs> I give in to shopping. Pier 1 towers of turquoise and silver ball ornaments sparkle from raised displays. Everything's peacock blue and feathery. I pile a basket with some Thanksgiving stuff, all the while thinking, how's this going to turn out? It's like trying on clothes when I'm in a bad mood. I put one thing on, rip one thing off. I choose mastectomy with a sentinel node biopsy. No reconstruction for now. I want to heal and hear the lab results first. I'd had my breasts for 50 plus years, teenage blossoming, breastfeeding my child, and into womanhood. After making the decision, I spend a couple of weeks getting ready for change. The surgeon's nurse tells me that I'll have some drainage tubes and bandages, so find a nightgown that opens in the front. Turns out, Nordstrom's lingerie department has a specialist. She looks like a college girl with a pink tape measure around her neck. She pops into my dressing room with a couple of pink and white striped boxes. Alterations can sew a breast pocket into a bra, cami, or even a naughty swimming suit. My eyes are on those boxes. She showed me a sample prosthetic breast in the naughty bra or cam. I ordered two boobs, 
one for every day and one for swimming in chlorine pools in the salty Pacific. In lighter moments, I think about boogie boarding again, the way a wave can sometimes rip off my bathing suit. What if someone finds a fake rubber boob floating around like a jellyfish? <laughs> December 6, 2006, the night before my surgery. I double-checked the hospital list. No food or drink after 10 p.m. Bring the insurance card ID, no deodorant, no makeup, no jewelry. I pack the new front opening gown, an iPod with downloads of nature sounds for relaxation, smashing pumpkins for my rage, and Amy Mann for twisted Christmas tunes. I bring an old eye mask from an overnight flight. I'm anticipating sharing a hospital room, the kind where you see other people, hear other patients and their families through the curve of curtains rounding the bed. Probably I'll just be sitting there afterwards bandaged up with my one boob, feeling like I'm in a cheap motel with thin walls. I'm done with the list, and I sneak over to my bookshelf, and I throw away some stuff in case I die on the operating table. Old journals that I never wanted anyone to read. I get stuck leafing through some of the old hurts, the worries, the wishes of my 30s and 40s. I come across a line I'd inked in from Shakespeare's Hamlet. I read it. There's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I climb into bed beside Dawn, and we spend a few minutes looking out the window at the twinkling lights of Ocean Beach before pulling the drapes. He tells me he loves me and not to worry about anything changing after the surgery. I believe him. He set the alarm for 4.30 a.m., and as I take off my glasses, I think, tomorrow, just before surgery, Don will be there. I'll give up my ID, my phone, my glasses, and then I'll give up my breast. Nancy Carey.